Hello again, everybody. To the best of my knowledge, I have the same job that I did at 9 o'clock this morning, which is uh, <laughs> Chief Impact Strategist at Community Capital Management. And we do have a no mantle policy at my company, which I'm here violating. Uh, so the, the panel is called uh, Debt and Democracy. And I guess I'd like to begin by saying I hope we can all agree that both debt and democracy can be very, very good things when used properly but when abused or misused, maybe not so much. And I'll leave the democracy abuse out of this discussion since we're all reading the newspapers and uh, living our lives. But uh, a lot of interesting perspectives here, as Josh said, uh, on debt. Uh, interesting panel. We're going to geek out a little bit. You're going to join us. If you feel like we're taking you to a place where you want uh, a help or a lifeline, just, just tell me. And I certainly um, will do that as well. Um, but first. Tom from the Center for Responsive Lending, which is affiliated with Self Help, who kind of a hometown uh, hero here, uh, is going to talk a little bit about some of the work that you've done historically relating to mortgage and then also key us up for a discussion on student loans, student debt. Great. Thanks, David. And uh, thanks to Josh for the last minute invitation. It's a pleasure to be here and to uh, talk about the Center for Responsible Lending's work. Uh, we're forming the mortgage market, um, documenting um, all of the harms of the mortgage market in low income communities and communities of color leading up to the crisis. Um, and then what we see uh, as, 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 a, as, as a way forward uh, post crisis for a sustainable mortgage market. Um, I'm Tom Feltner. I'm the director of research at CRL. I have been uh, with, with CRL for, for two years now, but have been active in financial services reform uh, for over 15 years uh, at various positions, including the Consumer Federation of America and the Woodstock Institute. Um, CRL is probably the best known for its mortgage work, and so that's why I, I'm, I'm, ex I'm excited to, to kick this off, particularly given, um, given Bill's uh, 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 comments that he's going to make later on um, in the session about, uh, about how we can best move forward with the sustainable mortgage market and, 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 and the securitization process within that. Um, but again, CRL is probably best known for its work leading up to, to, to the crisis and documenting um, the harm of risky predatory products in low-income communities and communities of color. Um, some of our path-breaking research going all the way back to 2006 um, showed the increased likelihood that African-American borrowers would receive a higher rate subprime loan with a prepayment payment penalty at uh, a 31% higher likelihood uh, to receive a higher rate for a fixed rate purchase loan, a 15% uh, 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 like, uh, higher likelihood that, that African-Americans receive an adjustable rate, a higher adjustable rate purchase loan. Um, and we found, found many of the same um, uh, uh, disparities within the markets uh, to, to Latinos. We compared this to predominantly um, white communities and white borrowers controlling for loan to value, uh, debt to income, and, 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 uh, and, and credit score. And so this really helped us understand um, uh, the concentration of high cost products within uh, the communities that, that, that we serve leading up to the crisis, again, 2006 and onwards. Um, once the crisis hit, we continued our work uh, documenting the concentration of foreclosures in those same communities um, and found, uh, the, found the, the, the incidence of, of foreclosure to be twice as high in African-American communities and Latino communities as non-Hispanic white communities. Um, so what the cumulative effect of this is, which, which, is which, which we sum up as discrimination in housing, discrimination in lending, and discrimination in pricing, um, all, all have had the net effect of erasing African-American home ownership gains uh, that, that have been achieved since uh, the passage of the Fair Housing Act. So between 1970 and 2000, a 5.5% gain in African-American home ownership rates. Between 2000 and 2015, a 6.1% decrease. Um, we actually see, uh, and we see um, a, a very uh, 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 similar change within, within Latino communities. Um, so overall, uh, kind, of, kind of that kind of shows the, the, the work that we have done leading up to the crisis and our understanding and our, and our interpretation of the impact of that crisis. Um, Post-crisis, we continue to see uh, uh, a, a much tighter, less inclusive mortgage market. And I'm going to talk a little bit about what, what all of those, what, what all, each of, the, each of those, uh, those, those concepts mean, mean, mean to us. But overall, we see fewer loans overall. We see fewer loans made um, to, to low-income people, fewer loans made to, 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 to people of color. And when those loans are made, they are far more likely to be FHA loans. Um, we can talk a little bit about the pricing dynamics that have, that have contributed um, uh, uh, to that later, but the net effect is that looking at conventional markets, that is uh, uh, conventional loans, that is loans backed by Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, lower priced loans, um, uh, uh, generally under 30-year uh, 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 fixed rate loans, um, 
the convention, uh, African Americans and, and Latinos had about a 90% market share within the conventional market uh, before the crisis. That plunged to just under 20% immediately following the crisis and has not recovered in the same way that predominantly white communities have. They now hold roughly about 30% of, the, of, the, of, 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 of loans are, are, are conventional loans. Again, lower cost, 30-year fixed rate loans, um, non-FHA loans. We uh, generally understand stand this as, 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 again, tightening mortgage restrictions um, and, uh, and, um, and out of aggressive risk-based pricing that has dramatically risen the cost of, of mortgage credit for low-income people and, and communities of color post-crisis. The effect of this is that while we see default rates uh, considerably lower than we did during the era, which we consider a much more inclusive and reasonable lending standard era, 2001 to 2003, um, where we saw, saw default rates, um, which is borrow risk plus product risk, uh, hovering around 12%. We now see uh, default rates much less than that with almost zero product risk uh, and substantially lower borrower risk. Um, uh, we, looking kind of at the, at the, the composition of that market, um, I think that is, that is uh, um, kind of best explained as a, as a shifting up in, 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 in borrower risk profile. Um, the, the percentage of, of, the, of the market 560 and over has more than doubled since 2003. Um, the percentage of, of the, the convention of uh, uh, FICO scores, the percentage of the market 620 and below has more than halved. Um, so overall, um, we see kind of a, 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 a much less inclusive, much more restrictive market. Um, and, uh, and I think as we think about what, um, what mortgage finance should look like going forward, we pull together a number of recommendations. Um, I think there are, there are many things to like about, about uh, the, the existing system of mortgage finance, and I think Bill and I will have a healthy discussion about that um, a after his opening remarks. Um, but there's also things that we think need, need to be changed. Um, I think the, the first is we need to continue to share e equal treatment for all lenders, including small lenders. We need an origination platform um, that can continue to serve small lenders um, and, and, uh, and, um, uh, and uh, lenders that are say, serving rural areas. Um, second, we need to serve all markets across the country throughout the business cycle by preserving the duty to serve uh, a, a mandate. We need to serve all creditworthy borrowers, um, moving away from, again, that, that the, the, the targeting of higher cost products to low-income people and communities of color that we saw pre-crisis. Uh, we need to promote cost-effective loan modifications and preserve the 30-year fixed-rate mortgage. I know that Bill and I will talk a little bit more about that later. Areas where, where we think we need to, to, to move forward with meaningful change, we need to maintain a strong regulator. Uh, we need to provide an explicit and fully paid for government guarantee. We need to put more private capital in front of that, that government guarantee. Um, and, we, and we need to, to move to a, a mutual ownership or utility regulation that will lower the cost of capital uh, that, that the GSEs are, are, are required to hold. Um, I think I have, so I have about, about, about four minutes, minutes left, and that is kind of our, the way that we, we have, have approached financial services reform within the mortgage market post-crisis. We also see a lot of simil uh, uh, similarities within the, the student loan market. I know that Bill ha also has, has a lot of experience kind of working within the student loan market and how student loans are, secur are securitized, and we'll talk about some of those parallels uh, shortly. But the student loan market right now um, is, is, has, has skyrocketed. It's now over uh, $1.4 trillion in 2018. Um, it has, it has, has, has exceeded the outstanding balances on, on HELOCs, on auto loans, on credit cards, on, 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 on installment loans, um, and gone from about $200 billion in 2003 to $1.4 trillion in 2018. We'll talk a little bit about some of the drivers of that. Um, at the same time, student loans now top all, all, all uh, uh, um, uh, 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 credit project, uh, uh, products in, in, in default rates, skyrocketing from 6% to 12% over that same time period, and now dramatically exceeding the default rates on mortgage auto, credit cards, and other loans. Um, the public is widely um, concerned about this increase in student loan debt, and that concern is bipartisan. Um, CRL conducts an a, a annual tracking poll about the public's uh, 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 view um, of, uh, of various financial services products and, and policy interventions. Um, one of those, when, when asked about whether or not uh, a, the uh, rising level of student loan debt is considered a crisis, 66% um, of the public uh, believed that it, wa that, that, that it was, including um, uh, seven to one uh, uh, Democrats, six to one independents, um, three to one Republicans. Um, so uh, when we think about what the drivers of that are and how to best move forward, CRL has focused this area, it, it, its work on, 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 on three areas. Um, uh, protecting students from abuses within the for-profit school uh, market, and, and we'll talk a little bit more about that later. 
Um, second, ensuring uh, uh, fair and sustainable repayment options and continuing to pursue non-loan uh, options for financial education, such as making sure that Pell Grants keep up with, uh, with, with, with the, uh, the uh, uh, cost of credit and making sure uh, the, the cost of, of education, and then also making sure that, uh, that, that state grants are not used uh, to continue to support um, uh, uh, for-profit schools with poor outcomes. Um, so as the um, and I think as we as we think about how to move forward post post crisis, I'm excited. I'm excited to have, continue to have a robust discussion about both of those issues. I know that we'll get into the weeds um, quite a bit, but I know with that, I'm happy to, to turn it over to Bill. Okay. Thanks, Tom. Bill, yeah. take it away. Hi. Can people hear me? Not yet. Does that is that better, Allison? No. <clears throat> Closer, Closer to my, does that work yeah. better? Okay. Thank you. Uh, hi, everyone. My name is Bill Harrington. I'm a senior fellow here at the Croton Institute, and I've been affiliated with the Institute formally um, since December and informally for a couple of years. Um, my background is in the extremely complex finance, which was at the heart of the financial crisis. In my work, both while a practitioner and since resigning from the financial sector in 2010, has been as a private citizen advocate to try and avoid another financial crisis. Um, I have, I believe, strong and unique credentials to do so. And as an aside, it is true that I'm white. I'm also gay, so I have some other affiliation. And that is <laughs> completely relevant to the discussion. Because in the course of my career, I met such hostile and overt discrimination that I decided I had to become a specialist in something so that my subject matter knowledge would be my job protection. And this was my job strategy. Uh, I was born in 1961. I was precluded from doing jobs, for, for instance, working for the State Department when I passed a foreign service exam in the mid, um, mid 1980s. And um, so instead, I embarked on a career of international finance. I have an MBA in finance. I was a senior vice president in the derivatives group at Moody's Investor Service from 1999 until 2010. I worked on derivative contracts that are used all around the world and which are critical parts of securitizations that do not work. The RMBS securities that failed in the US had these derivative contracts. And in fact, they could not have been issued without them. Most uh, residential mortgage-backed securities in Europe continue to use these derivative contracts, including three that have gotten a green um, uh, awards for being great green deals uh, because a, a certain portion of the portfolio of an issuer meets green standards, which is good, but they use terrible financial technology to raise money, which is bad. In the US, the student loan sector still uses these derivative contracts. They're asset-backed securities or securitizations with derivative contracts embedded in them. And those embedded derivatives hide lots of risks. And when lots of risks are hidden, they sometimes explode, and then sometimes we have financial crises. And then whatever individual or series of concerns you have are made worse by the social fallout, I believe. Uh, when we have a financial crisis, and even more so when practitioners don't try and build a better system afterwards. Um, I worked at Moody's until 2010. I saw how Moody's was reacting to Dodd-Frank, and I resigned. I spent six months trying to think of what I might do and decided I know more about the deals than most people at Moody's, most people at the investment banks, and most regulators. I'm going to, there's this thing called a comment process, and I'm going to start inserting myself into the comment process. I started with pro, proposed rules for NRSROs, which are SEC, uh, um, SEC sanctioned rating agencies, so that's Moody's, S&P, Fitch, DBRS, and five others. And as I was looking at the form, it said, please be careful what you say. This is the SEC form. Everything you say will be memorialized. And I said, yes, please. <laughs> and I spent four months uh, writing a 40,000 word submission to the NRSRO. I was the only submitter who, not the only submitter, but the only submitter who answered every question I possibly could. Fitch responded with two pages. The proposed rules were about 300 pages. Um, and during that process, I learned a great thing. For instance, if the SEC in this case announces a proposed rule 
on, say, June 1st, and they say there's a three-month deadline, as a private citizen, you think, oh my God, I have to get this done by July, August, September 1st. And I was in this, this position, and I wasn't happy with the paper, and then I found out there's this thing called the Federal Register, and the timeline doesn't start until something is posted in the Federal Register. And I'm offering this because this was all things I had to teach myself. I've had almost no help whatsoever in the financial sector because it is so unpalatable to offer the insights that I have, such as the private label RMBS market cannot be a savior for the U.S. housing market. It embeds the, the, to grow to any extent, it would have to again embed the derivative contracts that offset the 30-year prepayment risk that is a, the standard mortgage product has. Sometimes when you're trying to fix a problem, you have to take the worst solutions off the table. Similarly, um, in the student loan sector, the company Navient, I do believe, is insolvent. And I believe it's insolvent because it owns the interests in the asset-backed securities that it uses to finance the student loans, and particularly the FELL student loans, which were issued in 2010. Navient also has embedded the same type of derivative contracts. Um, into the asset-backed security, so it's adding complexity upon complexity. Um, a, looking back at the Lehman crisis, Lehman Brothers had several of these derivative contracts while they are still being litigated 10 years later. One reason that I like my ability to advocate is I want to file an amicus brief with the Second Circuit, um, which I'll have to teach myself how to do, uh, with respect to a embedded derivative securitization case, which shows that Lehman got zero cents on the dollar. When we were here yesterday talking about how um, a portfolio of mortgages might be offloaded, the question was asked, what does that mean? And the explanation was, loans might be marked down from 100 cents on the dollar to 90 or 85 cents and sold. So there's a loss. In the derivative contracts that I track, which are embedded in securitization, they lose 100% of the dollar. And in a real world situation, I think Lehman was worth 20 billion and not 30 billion on the eve of its collapse. Uh, so at any rate, my amicus brief would be, decide on the law, there's no public policy here. There, these, these type of securitizations should be retired. I can't go through the rating agency world because they pretend that a securitization, no matter how complex or simple, deserves a triple A. And an outcome of the work, and this is important, if uncomfortable for fixed income investors to hear, in my view, from having read all the rating methodologies, not from speaking to people, but from reading the methodologies, which enjoy First Amendment protection and therefore have no accountability whatsoever, the rating for any issuer in any sector that uses derivatives is too high. Because the rating agencies don't distinguish between issuers that use derivatives and don't use derivatives. And one reason this might ultimately lead to financial catastrophe again is because of up to 90% of a certain type of derivative, those that aren't cleared on clearing houses, are parked in the FDI subsidiaries of four mega banks. Four of the five largest banks, book most of the unclear derivative contracts, and they book them through their FDIC insured subsidiaries, which means we all and everybody in the country subsidize the financial sector. These aren't issues that the financial sector likes to hear. But I, I, I'm going to check my, I, this is a good place to end. Um, the advantage of having been self-funded and using my free speech to counter the terrible free speech of credit rating agencies is it's enabled me to learn about Dodd-Frank, uh, about the state of play of international regulation, and one of the points of my advocacy now is to forget the rating agencies, it's sort of a lost cause, but to try and keep some Dodd-Frank rules which are highly specific in the derivatives rule in the world, which remain intact, to keep them intact. Um, and I. Part of that is by doing more and more directed comments to right now the regulator that I'm interested in is the CFTC, the Commodities Futures Trading Commission. So 10 years after Lehman, uh, the economy's healthier, uh, the big banks are fewer in number but healthier, a lot of the crisis era finance has been reduced and now it's a rear guard action to keep that from coming back into the system. Great. So 
question for each of you, because a lot of what you said makes it sound like history is going to potentially repeat itself. A couple names change, but maybe the experience, unfortunately, would be the same. So the question I have is what has changed in the decade or so since we got into the most recent financial crisis? And, and two things that come to mind specifically, both from the fintech space or bubble, depending on your perspective, um, using non-traditional credit issues for mortgage lending, right? We have all of these internet-enabled, machine learning, all this other stuff, I don't even know what half of it is, that, that tells you about the potential uh, creditworthiness of a borrower independent of his or her FICO score, that's one. And then in the student loan sector, it's still very small, but we see a lot of interest in uh, participating student loans where the payback is a percentage of income uh, over the, the career uh, of the student when they become uh, a graduate or, or join the workforce. So any chance that either of those or anything like that that wasn't around in the late 2000s could, could alter the outcomes for where we're going? Sure, I'm happy to kick us off. I think that you know, we have seen substantial improvement over the last eight years. Um, in particular, many of the mortgage restrictions within Dodd-Frank have gone a long way to, to reducing the, the prevalence and impact of very risky loan products such as option arms. Um, the, QM, the, the CFPB QM rule, I think, has, has, has set an effective standard for safe and sustainable lending. I think there are, there are you know, we need, we need to continue, make sure that we, that we can preserve. QM um, is a qualified mortgage. Um, so I think I think we need we need to make sure that we preserve those those th those improvements. I think we continue to see efforts to roll back large portions of Dodd Frank, um, in 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 particular the ability of the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, which is the regulator set up uh, after Dodd Frank, um, to oversee consumer financial products um, and marketplaces and to make sure that they work um, for 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 consumers. I think we, you know, we, we, as, as we continue to see efforts to roll that back, including its anti-discrimination authority, including its ability to field consumer complaints and to, to identify these types of problems before they become widespread, it's going to be absolutely essential to, to, to preventing a, another crisis going forward. Um, as far as innovative products, um, you know, I think that, uh, that, that the way that, um, that, that market participants uh, enter and exit the mortgage market is highly cyclical. Um, leading up to, to, to the crisis, we see a lot of non-banks uh, 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 enter the market, grab a huge percentage of market share. Um, they, not non-banks are able to lend to a much larger credit box than, 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 than depositories, but um, largely because they, many of them are, are, are thinly capitalized, disappear um, during, during downturns with new non-banks uh, emerging afterwards. And that's that when we uh, recently released a paper looking at the trajectory of non-banks within, the FHA, uh, within the, the FHA space, noting that nearly all of the top 10 non-banks pre-crisis um, uh, have none of the market share and all of the market share is now held by non-banks that did not exist before the crisis. Um, so I think that, uh, that, that you know, efforts to, 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 to widen the credit box um, need to be seriously considered. You know, we continue to be concerned about, um, about uh, um, many kind of fintech approaches um, that use uh, um, uh, uh, a lot of information, most of which is coming, say, from outside um, the Fair Credit Reporting Act, um, that does not necessarily have have the the the, the ability to identify errors, to correct errors, um, to to prevent discrimination. Um, so I think we need to we need to monitor that space very closely to make sure that you know what is what is 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 is, is predictive is 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 in fact also fair. Um, I think moving into to, to, to student lendings, much of our work is again focused on, present, uh, on, on, on preventing abuses before they become widespread. You know, we continue to look at new payment options, at new, at new pay, uh, 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 payment arrangements. We think the number one priority moving forward um, it is, is, uh, is preventing widespread abuse among for-profit schools that have been, that have been driving debt, um, have very poor outcomes, um, and very poor completion rates. Uh, my focus isn't on the product, so I, I can't speak to the individual products. Um, but there is um, an outcome of my work. I, I was trained as an economist, and I, I worked as an economist at Wharton Econometrics. My job was to for, uh, work in the international markets. I forecasted currencies and uh, non-US economies. 
And in following the general economic discourse, I am persuaded by the argument that we can't have uh, fast growth the way we did in the post-war period. And an outcome of that is in one form or another, almost everything is actually going to get more expensive. There's just no way around it. The, when I spoke about securitizations, I have to admit the GS, have to admit the GSEs. I don't work on those, and they, they work on a U.S. government guarantee um, uh, scheme rather than a pure securitization scheme. And I think actually that is going to be the answer going forward. And I, I agree that in this moment, in this day, that's not the way the country is. I'm not convinced that's not not going to switch very quickly again. Um, with respect to, the, to student loans in particular, there really isn't a market for students to borrow other than those uh, subsidized loans. Everything else is done by co parents co-signing. Um, and so I don't think FinTech can fix that, or, or at least it, it was that way maybe until a year or two ago. I see someone shaking their head, so I don't, I don't want to speak definitively. So it could be that we have to rethink everything, for instance, students sharing their, their earning proceeds with colleges. It, was, it seemed so unnecessary or so unfair before, but I think we're going to get into an era where everything is going to seem unfair, and so what is least unfair? It might be that if you choose a school and are working with the people in the school as to how you'd like to earn a living, then maybe they should be bearing some of the risk. I, I, I don't have an answer for that. Um, so. Okay. Uh, we have time for some questions. If there's folks that want to dig in here, otherwise we can keep talking up here. Yeah? Sorry, Chrissy, jumped it on you. I'm sorry. Sorry? I knew you, I knew you were ready, so. So, Bill, I was wondering, for those of us who don't work in the securities world day to day, if you could explain the concept of a derivative. I'm so happy. Yep. I'm so happy. I'm so happy you asked that. <laughs> you can ask another question too. But th this is this is the first convening that I've been to, and I was trying to think of how to reach out to people. And one of the things I need to do with my advocacy is use plain language to discuss. Um, what I do. And we I had a prep call. We talked about that on the prep call. But. <laughs> so I, I think I can do it in 10 words or less. First of all, a derivative contract is a contract. And that is the first thing to remember. You, everybody has signed some sort of a contract. A derivative contract is a contract. Forget the numbers. Forget the quantitative physics that surround it. It's a contract. And typically, two parties to a contract can decide to do anything. A derivative, the two parties decide to exchange commodities for some period of time. Very often the commodity is cash, and, but it could be another commodity. It could be grain. It could be gold. The period of time could be a week. It could be a month. It could be 50 years. So already if you're thinking about a contract that lasts 50 years, I think people would think, maybe I don't exactly know what all my obligations would be over the course of 50 years. The derivatives world pretends that they can value that so precisely for the next 50 years, exactly what this exchange will be, worse, will be worth. And the reason that that should seem foolish on its face is the amounts that will be exchanged are unknown today. The formula is set, but the amounts are unknown. On every payment day, you look to the formula and say, well, what does the formula tell me? So I'm going to stop for a second. I actually want to ask if that's helping you understand. Okay. <laughs> so, in my mind, if the context is by the payment for that period, um, which is unknown, could be superficially high because of a change in market context. And so that's what makes it complicated? It's one of the things that makes it complicated, but yes, you, you, might be, you might be tied to two indices and one is a floating rate treasury. We don't know what the treasury rates will be 40 years down the road, so that could be a surprise. And the other could be uh, the price of grain, and we don't know what that will be either. But they have an additional source of surprise, and that is if you break the contract before its legal final date, you might be incurring all sorts of other surprises. So the snarkiest analogy I can give you is if you break a marriage contract and you have to have a divorce settlement that is really unsettling. You didn't expect to pay this amount. You didn't expect to be in the position you would be. Well, derivatives have that uh, quality. A lot of the ability to break the contract ahead of time are established 
one party or the other can do it unilaterally. And then there are surprises both on the valuation, because for instance, if it's a 50-year derivative and you break it at the 10-year point, you have 40 years of uncertainty. But sometimes there are fees associated with it. And the securitization world has a deep, dirty secret that they base their derivatives on. It's called a walkaway provision, which is not even clearly enforceable under US law. When there was a question of what I'm concerned about artificial intelligence, it's that unenforceable legal provisions will be coded into contracts by coders and modeled by quantum physicists who know the latest numeric tricks, but don't actually know that the legal provisions aren't binding. So that when you encounter the legal provision, guess where you are? You're in bankruptcy court. Um, so does that help the second part? So, so Bill, why don't we, since we're doing this, talk about counterparty risk a little bit, particularly in the context of large financial institutions and smaller financial institutions. Uh, okay. Hmm. If you will, professor. <laughs> no, it's not professor. It's just hard-earned pra practitioner yes. experience. Um, one of the ways to inoculate the system against these unknown amounts is to do what is called, <coughs> called posting margin. And Dodd-Frank on the swaps market, which is a type of derivative, has fantastic best practice uh, rules enshrined. It took five years to do so. Dodd-Frank was passed in July 2010. The swap margin rules came out in October 2015. They are outstanding. One of the things they do is make the parties, the two parties, say a big bank and another big bank, settle up every day and fully reflect the uncertainty. And they both have to agree, which doesn't change the risk that there could be surprises down the road, but it does reduce the risk that one or the other repudiates the contract as having been unfair. Um, the question becomes, in finance, whether small institutions should do the same. And this becomes a public policy decision. There was a type, and I have to use my, I, again, I was working, I, was, I worked for Merrill Lynch before I went to Moody's. I worked for Wharton Econometrics. I don't know all the ins and outs of the different type of local financing institutions. But there were very, very large, non, uh, very, I don't want to use community banks, because I don't think, think it has the same sense that we use here. Like Zion Bank was one of them. They played the securitization game, and they played it with these embedded derivative contracts, as did many of their ilk. They issued something called a trust preferred security, which was, had the worst of equity and debt, and then they packaged them into CDOs and put in the derivative contract that I particularly find noxious. There was AAA uh, securitization, and those same issuing banks bought the AAA paper and put it on their balance sheets. So I have a different view as to who is responsible for taking care of their own business, and I, my answer is everyone. I think if there is a subsidy to be given to say that there could be really small institutions that they, they just enter into one interest rate swap for five years, they have a portfolio of mortgages and they need to hedge that, then you start making a case that these are individual instances where it would be overkill, it would defeat public policy. The problem is the biggest banks in the world are trying to claim that carve out too, and they are fighting tooth and nail to reduce the Dodd-Frank swap margin and uh, rules, and they're sort of arguing anything they can argue, but overkill is one of them. And again, the, the, the focus right now is at the CFTC, and Chairman Giancarlo has gone on a European tour, and he is quoting Shakespeare and saying uh, not every swap is dangerous, and we have, we have, the first thing to do is make sure that U.S. affiliates operating overseas don't have to abide by U.S. rules they can buy, abide by overseas rules. It is a way of the big banks trying to piggyback on some of the exemptions that the smaller banks have when they operate in the complex finance arena. Thank you. you any thoughts on any of this, Tom? You want to <laughs> jump in here? Otherwise, maybe no. there's other. You, you don't have to. Do you want to? No, I mean I, th I mean, I think that you know, when, we, when we think about uh, oh. But again, you know, wh when we think about you know, what, um, what social impact investing can do for this particular market, I think that it is, it is clear that we need to expect better from the housing market and preserve the meaningful rules that we have. I think um, you know, the, 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 the title of this panel um, and, the, and, and the description is the financial sector is too large 
too complex and too dependent on government support. I think that we have, uh, over the last half hour, have agreed that it is large, that it is also complex. I would argue that government support is critical for the types of, of, uh, of public goods that we're talking about, that is housing and access to education. Um, these, are, these, are, these are highly complicated markets, these, as, 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 as Bill has, 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 has discussed. But in a way, the, the, the goal is to, is to deliver uh, meaningful education and asset building opportunities through home ownership. Um, and I think that is, so, so, so I think we need, to, we need to, to, to hold on to what has worked, expect better from the housing market, expect better from the student loan market, um, and, 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 and make sure that we continue to support work that recognizes that, 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 that there is a public interest function to both of these products. And expect better, perhaps, from investors as well. Tom, did you have a question? Yes, uh, Tom, Mr. Cambridge Associates. Thank you all very much. I, I love the geeky conversation uh, and had a pretty close view of, of everything melting down as we're thinking about back about 10 years of Lehman. Um, but as we do that, it also makes me think things to keep me awake and I know that we're definitely, definitely steps closer to the next meltdown. Um, we've certainly, a big part of our recovery, if you will, from that period of time has been cheap money provided by the Fed. And I'm sitting here looking at my phone right before I get in here and seeing that everyone's excited that the 30 year treasury is slightly over 3%, uh, as is the 10 year. So, flat yield curve notwithstanding. Sorry, I won't go any more geek on that. Um, we're exceptionally good at planning for the last crisis. So, for all the adaptions that we've made in the mortgage markets and the things that we're looking at in the loan markets, um, I really don't know where the next credit problem will be. It might be in mortgages, it could be. A, it could be a corporate debt. I mean, there's a whole host of things where people push money in. So I'm curious of your thoughts of what you're worried about when you look forward. And then when you think about your specific, when you think about the mortgage markets in general and, and the great work that you do at Center for Responsible Lending and your analysis of Protein Institute, um, do you think we have enough in there through Dodd Frank and will the, the key parts of that stay in place um, to withstand the next one? because I think we only have so much fuel in the tank with the Fed to lower rates further and help mm -hmm. people recover and make money cheaper. Sure. I think um, for, for the mortgage market, we have the protections in place that we need. We need to hold on to them. That is um, uh, uh, CFPB rules that prevent the widespread uses of, of, of risky products. Um, I think that we have a, a, a regulator that has the tools to set capitalization requirements within the GSEs um, at the right levels that, 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 that preserve an inclusive market. And, uh, and, don't, uh, and don't require capital that's necessary to cover the catastrophic losses of the last crisis. Um, again, because we had those rules in place to prevent, to prevent many of those product, uh, the, the, that pro those product risk losses that the CFPB was put in place to, to, to ensure didn't happen again. Um, I think that, that we need to pay very close attention to, to how FHFA sets, capital, sets capitalization requirements, and there is a, there's an open comment period right now that, CF, uh, that, that CRL uh, and many of our, of our colleagues will be, will, will be uh, uh, commenting on. Um, I think you know, shifting over to, 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 to student lending, student lending is, 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 is very tricky. Many of the Obama era regulations are there, there, there's an effort to, to roll many of those back. The gainful employment rule uh, 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 is, 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 is one. So I think that we need to be um, you know, very mindful of holding on to the limited tools that we have within the student loan space um, and, not, uh, and, and, and not allowing those to, to, to get rolled back again. Um, you know, we don't ha necessarily have, have many of the same um, underwriting requirements in student lending that we have, that we, that we, have, that we achieved in mortgage lending o o over the last eight years. So much of the, re the restrictions that, 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 that we have are very much kind of based on the, 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 the institution and the, the likelihood of a successful outcome at that institution. So they are more institution level protections than borrower level protections. Um, so I think that we need to continue to make sure that, um, that, 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 um, that, that students are not on the hook for, for, for uh, or a, a, a education from a school that closed. I think we need to continue to make sure um, that, uh, that, that, that students have, have a high likelihood of, 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 of excelling in the program of their choice, regardless of what institution that they, that they, that they, uh, that they enter into. And I want to give an example of that. CRL does, does a considerable amount of qualitative research and interview, does in-depth interviews um, with students who finance for-profit schools. Um, you know, I mean, one, one quote from a, from a, a borrower in, in Central Florida, I started making, out, making $12 an hour as a medical assistant. The school had told me I'd be making $35,000 to $40,000 per year. That never materialized. 
Um, I think, and I think that you know, as more and more of those experiences kind of get b baked into those types of, 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 of educational outcomes, we get kind of a, 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 a diminished uh, uh, outlook for, for education as a whole. Um, one one, one the student said, I don't even tell my daughter that she needs to go to college because I feel so, feel, feel like, feel like I, I was used. I can't believe for the rest of my life I'm going to dedicate to paying everything back. Um, so when we have those types of, 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 of of outcomes across the system, I think it's, it's, it's clear that we really need, need, to, need to dramatically uh, uh, strengthen the tools that we have to address the student loan crisis. Well, I, I want to echo what everyone here, here most likely believes, is, is that the loss of the CFPB as an active agent is really exceptionally harmful for every aspect, from financial stability to, to human uh, development. They were one of the entities I could continue sending my research to um, even after the, the change in administration. With respect to are things better, um, I'm very concerned what would happen if we had a combination financial crisis and economic recession again. I don't think the country is near, nearly as resilient as before and we know we're running huge budget deficits. We do not have the resources to do what we did in 2008 and that itself was considered very controversial. That's one of the reasons I think the Dodd-Frank provisions which are intact have to stay intact. Dodd-Frank is huge. It is a huge, massive, massive piece of legislation and there are elements such as Tom just mentioned that maybe they do need to be revised but in the systemic world of finance I think they need to be preserved if not strengthened. And directly to your point, um, corporate borrowers use a vehicle called a collateralized loan obligation, which is a variant of a collateralized debt obligation, which is a variant of the securitization that bought securitized residential mortgage-backed securities. The corporate loan uh, CLOs use this, are gearing up to use the same type of derivative contract. They put them in their priority of payments. They put a flip clause in their priority of payments, even though Dodd-Frank precludes them from executing a flip clause swap right now. So they are clearly, at the very least, like their chances of potentially overturning the swap margin rule. The question is why? If the, if the economy is doing better, what needs to be geared up even more in the financial sector? And so I think there is still some ugly fear, not just with respect to what I think are people in this room, but even policymakers, even, and, and, a, and a, a, a sort of a support of that is, I worked at Moody's Investor Service for 11 years. I've worked as a journalist subsequently. I put all of my research in the public domain. I make it very uncomfortable for the credit rating agencies to continue assigning their terrible ratings. And yet, I cannot get a meeting anywhere. Why are they afraid of me? Why are they afraid of one person who knows complex, an aspect of complex finance at least as well as anybody in the world? And I don't think it's greed, I think it's fear. I think the practitioners know on some level that the system still is shakier than they would like to present. I'm gonna try to do a little bit of a pep talk before we take the next question. <laughs> on, on, on Tom's question, um, you know, it, it keeps coming up, it's in the paper, uh, it's a long, we've had a long recovery in some areas. Um, to me, the question isn't so much, is there going to be another correction, is there going to be another explosion? Uh, I think they said mortgage uh, fraud found in applications is back to the same level that it was, having gone close to zero, it's back up to the level it was 2005 or six. Um, to me, it's a question of what is or isn't correlated. So the lesson we learned 10 years ago, or the lesson we should have learned, is that so-called non-correlated assets, in fact, are deeply correlated. They're held in the same institutional portfolios, so when one thing gets in trouble, you have a margin call or a need for liquidity, and so suddenly the investment that might be in somebody's portfolio in Germany or in Estonia is affected by housing prices uh, in Cleveland. So if we're looking at a local investment economy, if we're looking at systems that are truly local, that have a connection to the global capital markets, but not as much or as deep a connection as traditional finance, then in fact, looking ahead to the next disaster, maybe some of the stuff that we've been talking about over the last couple of days will once again show that it's truly non-correlated unlike some of the things that are sold in financial services as non-correlated, which turn out to be deeply correlated. Hi, I'm Alison Jones with Latino Community Credit Union. 
my question is about the student debt um, question. And you mentioned looking at the for-profit institutions, but is there any work that you're doing on the nonprofit um, institution side of just the rising price of, of education and how much that has changed over the past 30 years and if there's, there's any way to think about putting some breaks on that? Sure, I can, I can kick us off on that. Uh, yes, we, we are deeply concerned about the cost of college. Um, in addition to, um, to you know, our, our work reforming um, uh, 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 financing around for-profit schools and ensuring um, uh, access to reasonable repayments uh, uh, options, you know, we, 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 we continue to, 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 to push for uh, again, non non loan financing for 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 schools. I think the second um, yeah, the 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 second area of work is again making sure that that, that state grants uh, you know a critical part of 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 uh, of, um, of student of of, uh, of education financing, um, and one that does not have to be repay payback does not get sent um, to to schools with with very poor outcomes such as for profit schools. Um, I think that uh, that that. Uh, uh, Kind of outside of uh, of that, I think you know two two rules that that I that I mentioned um, uh, borrower defense, which 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 allows borrowers to 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 not have to repay loans taken out for for, for fraudulent ed education programs or education programs that have that have collapsed, um, as well as uh, as um, um, uh, the 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 uh, uh, gainful employment rule, um, which 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 uh, which says that that you cannot continue to receive um, uh, uh, financial fund or financial um, mm -hmm. Aid funds for, 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 for programs that have um, very poor outcomes. So I think that there is there is both both a, a non loan portion of that, but again we believe that there is there is important there is an important need for for additional government oversight uh, to prevent um, harm uh, harmful or or, or 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 programs with very poor outcomes from persisting um, and continuing to drive up the cost of education. But wasn't the question also uh, why are wealthier nonprofit schools forcing some of their students to go into debt? To me, that's a public policy and uh, cultural question more than it is one for the capital markets. But okay. <laughs> but yes, but I but but I think that that, that for 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 public schools that 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 Pell component is 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 an important uh, component because that is that is that is a way in which um, uh, 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 students can continue to keep up with the cost of education outside of the for-profit space at the at the at the the public university space. Can I just, uh, I can't add to the research uh, on the why colleges are, are expensive, but I can, in the work they did at DebtWire with my colleague Allison on the, the nexus of the Department of Education, Navient as the largest student loan company, and the need to keep, for whatever reason, uh, Navient's functioning. One of the things that a student can do is really check the information that she's getting on all of the pre, all of the payment options that she has there are several i think about 20 state attorneys general su suing navient now for pushing students to one type of program rather than the other the benefit to navient is one program enables it to keep the loans live and it will ultimately potentially bring more resources into the Navient asset-backed securities, and Navient owns the equity in those. And that is a substantial part of Navient's balance sheet. So Navient has a conflict of interest in giving advice to the student loan, bar, the student loan borrowers who are asking, what do I need to do? And so whether it's a public policy area or, or it exists and people don't know about it, I think you would actually almost need several people fact-checking the information that a borrower gets as, as to what is available to, uh, to her. And that is something that can be, done right, can be done now. It's just a very tricky documentation and uh, not much appetite right now to look in that nexus of the education department in Navient. Stephen Dianucci with your Cardell Farms. It's a fascinating conversation and an inspiring one. Um, and he speaks of a lot of innovation in the financial markets uh, that has been used and abused. But as I was listening to it, I was changing the name of the, the session from social crisis and systemic risk to something that might be relevant in the future, 
and probably already is, and that is, what if, what if this were a panel on social and environmental crisis is systemic risk? How do you build a debt market that is able to respond to that and serve us all? What are some features? What, what tools could we use? Okay, that's actually a nice segue to the work that I've done, and that was not a plan, so you can't hear me, so, so I appreciate that. One of the great things from my having joined Croatan, and I am extremely grateful to Croatan, um, is having a, a platform to do my research and colleagues to help me do it and to, and to help me fact check and log, logic check and see how we can develop the insights into something actionable. Uh, in July of this year, uh, I posted a working paper, a very serious academic working paper called Can Green Bonds Thrive in a Complex Finance Brownfield? And the complex finance brownfield is a securitization, overly complicated securitization world based on credit ratings that I'm describing to you. I would have much less problem with many types of securitizations if they didn't have AAA ratings because then the risks are apparent to everyone. Yesterday we heard about the improvement in soil which can be objectively measured and maybe if five different entities came in the amounts wouldn't have been they would have been in the same ballpark but slightly different. I think the pretending that finance is safer than it is is causing a major problem. So the first thing I would do is get rid of credit ratings, period. And I think I have a standing to sue the SEC because I am a disadvantaged practitioner I can't provide credit ratings by their policies. And what I would like to see the SEC do is remove the NRSRO distinction so that every investor has to do credit work themselves. There would be more jobs to begin with because more people would have to be doing the systemic credit. In my working paper, I propose a financial sustainability score. And I'm trying to improve on what I think is a really bad credit rating system. So it's not top heavy. It goes from minus 10 to something that could, has proven to cause a financial crisis, to plus 10, which is something we think is sustainable for the financial system. And I center it at minus two and not zero, because the mainstream finance is very clear we're gonna have periodic crises. Finance is designed to have crises. So minus two is where we are. If there are, uh, uh, my colleague Matt will present some of this tomorrow, and you'll see some uh, deals that I give a mi there's a minus eight or a minus seven, and there are criteria. But if there was no rating or an accurate rating, I might give that a plus 10, because the investors know what it is, and you can't pretend it's delivering something that it can't deliver. So I would actually say less technology in systemic finance, more individual evaluation of it. It's not the, the payment characteristics of changing a bond, it's pretending that, 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 um, that I think technical logical innovation in derivatives is almost, uh, it's, it's like Paul Volcker said, the only real technical logical innovation in finance is the ATM. And I think pretending is what is the problem. So in that way, I think people realize this anyway. So somehow it's getting people, and I hope the financial sustainability scale may be one way of doing it, just stop pretending. You might buy an asset that, for whatever reason for your portfolio, just don't pretend it's AAA. Because when you pretend things are AAA and they don't work well, that sets bailouts in motion. On the subject of stopping pretending, where is true cost accounting in your market rate returns? When are we going to start using an indicator, like genuine progress indicator that actually takes into account external realities, and environmental costs, and in start to move away from GDP as a measure of economic growth because it's, it's certainly causing us a lot of damage by continuing to build on that. Yeah, I, I don't pretend to have an answer to that question, but I will say uh, issuers and rating agencies get beat up on deservedly, but I think a lot of this is investors too. Um, Bill's absolutely right. A AAA rating doesn't mean anything except you should look at it with the expectation that when you go under the hood, that you're going to find a high credit quality for the expectation of getting those cash flows. No one should think or would think in a properly functioning world that that means you don't need to look at what the underlying asset is because it has the rating. But of course, we have a culture where because it has the rating, we say, oh, they must know what they're doing. So there might be interest rate risk in that instrument, but I don't have to worry about getting paid back. So 
Part of it is investors and their representatives doing the work that would have to be done in a no credit rating universe, doing some of that work and developing some of those tools now. And that's a lot easier said than done when you're dealing with multi-trillion dollar capital markets, but it doesn't seem like we're going to have any alternative. Once you accept the validity of looking at what it is that the sell side is trying to sell to you, then each investor has the option of determining what the criteria are that they're going to look at, including what we used to call non-financial criteria, which was a terrible term because it implied that they were less important, but things like sustainability, stewardship, and all of that. But that isn't the responsibility exclusively of issuers and rating agencies. It's a responsibility of the owners uh, and the, their representatives. Um, Matt, you can go to the Institute. Uh, I just want to follow up on the, the previous uh, answer about um, embedded credit ratings and, and uh, getting rid of the rating agencies and having people do their own assessments. Um, my own admittedly ignorant understanding of the issue is that, for me, like the Institute of Resources, for example, is that one of the primary problems in this space is that the credit rating agencies. Uh, their primary customers are these financial institutions who are designing these crappy, securitized uh, debt instruments. And so there's a huge conflict of interest. So it's not necessarily that the credit agencies need to go away altogether, but that there needs to be some sort of separation between the way it's currently structured. And I just, I don't, I, I don't I know if that's accurate this, uh, uh, what, what your thoughts on that are. I, th I think, actually, we're, we have a employ potential employment crisis and a, a potential um, um, investment analysis crisis. Combine the two and start teaching kids how to read balance sheets. Start teaching, take a group of five-year-olds and teach them what a company is. Make that part of their core curriculum so that 15 years from now, there are, there, as there should be, there are 20-year-olds who can look at a company and say, the written material does not correspond to what I'm seeing here. And it's not only on an indi individual loan basis. That's what we're hearing today. A person can look under the hood and see that things don't work, even in very complicated finance. I wish it was as simple as credit rating agencies being paid by the issuers. I wish it was that simple. I, I have, I've drawn up a list of 30 professions that I see that are implicated in this cycle that I discuss. And it begins with academicians, and it ends with underwriters. And it's got bankers and investors and issuers and journalists and regulators in there. Uh, I, don't, I know almost nobody who looks at complex finance critically in the securitization and derivatives world. I know many who lobby to continue for more. So I wish it were that simple. And the credit rating agencies, nor does any entity have a pot of gold that if we just find that, we can fix all the other problems. This is a big system that is too big and not accountable enough. And so actually, I like the idea. Teach get a, a group of kids who love math and they love companies and teach them coding as we've heard but teach them what a real company does and, t and teach them which is the case that by 20 you can assess a company just as well as anyone else particularly given the changes in technology which 20 year olds are much more comfortable with than anybody older than they are so we're going to take that bill as your summation and tom give you a chance to uh sure so i think so I, you know i, I think I just, I just want to want to wrap up that when we look at um, at the financial services market, that discriminatory pricing and and aggressively risk based pricing um, is its is itself a, ha, has a destabilizing effect. When we lock um, first time home buyers who are increasingly uh, uh, a borrower of, uh, of color out of the market, when we lock um, uh, 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 borrowers who who may need um, non traditional products out of the market. Um, we are uh, we, we are we are creating a, a a less inclusive market that is that is ultimately going to be more risky down that down the line. I think we've if we've seen nothing over the last ten years is that when we have a a, a concentration of, of of borrowers who have been discriminatory priced, when we have a concentration of borrowers who have received um, very risky products. Um, that in itself has a destabilizing effect on neighborhood. That the those the 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 foreclosures that are driven by those two drivers. Um, will drive down property uh, 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 values of, 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 of people who had who had perfectly reasonable mortgages. Um, I think that uh, that that there is that there is a, a a second and third order effect 
um, to this that itself is a, you know um, uh, uh, creates additional risk. So um, I hope that we can move forward with with reforms in the secondary market um, that, that again get us back to a much more inclusive market um, uh, where we are pooling risk rather than segmenting risk and that we can uh, apply many of the lessons learned to the student loan market as we continue to see it uh, 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 escalate. So. Great. Thank you to both of my panelists and thank you to all of you for the, for the session. <laughs>